Welcome back to the Woven Energy Podcast on real practical shamanism with me, Joseph Sykora and Damon Smith. We are here, as always, and once again, to talk about shamanism from the ground up. So this week, this episode, to mark our 50th episode, uh, we are going to start our deep dive, um, dig our rabbit hole, so to speak, into stage four of how to become a shaman or stage four of shamanic technique. Um, Now, If you haven't listened to the previous episode, episode 49, then I do suggest you go and do so because we talk about what the stages are in general. We talk about um, why perhaps it's both helpful and unhelpful at the same time to think about learning to be a shaman in terms of stages. Um, But we also give a really nice sort of... um, look at the three stages leading up to stage four and how they mold and weave into each other. So really worth going and listening to to prepare yourself for this episode. So with that said, uh, Damon, uh, it's good to uh, good to be back. How are you doing? Uh, good, mate. How are you? I'm not bad at all. Not bad at all. Um, so, uh, oh, I did want to mention one thing before we got going, um, and that is to all the listeners out there. Um if you are enjoying this podcast, uh, do two things, if you don't mind. Can you uh, go and give us a honest review on whatever podcast uh, service you listen to us on? It kind of, particularly Apple, it really helps us get our podcast in front of uh, new listeners. Um, but also, um, just a quick thought, if you know anybody at all um, who you think might enjoy this podcast or benefit from this podcast in any way, then just gently nudge them, introduce them to the podcast. You know, if a few of you do that, then we can get this podcast out by by word of mouth as well. So uh, I just wanted to mention that. That would be really helpful. Anyway, um, so Damon, how do you want to start then? Because this is an introduction to stage four. Um, so I guess you've got something in mind. So yeah. where do you want to start? So first of all, it's worth noting that stage four is what our podcast is named after. We call this podcast Woven Energy, and that's what stage four is all about. Good mm. in in Mongol. The the it, it's if, if you Damon's way of spelling Mongol words that would be G O O R O O K H, but the U's are quite short, Guruk. Guruk. And the general idea is that Guruk is something that arises out of Stage three, but of course, exactly. No, it, it actually. I was going to say the nature of it depends on what type of uh, shamanic technique you're applying at at stage three. Which uh, the psalm is is kind of spirit dance, if you like. But of course, you could be doing drum technique or one of many other shamanic techniques at level three. But then. With a couple of seconds of hindsight, I thought, well, it doesn't really matter. The The general idea of Guruk is the same, irrespective of what technique you're using, even if you were building shamanic pianos, uh, as we were talking about in the last one. Yeah. The, the idea is that through familiarity with the technique, you are becoming familiar with your body and how your body uh, works in relation to the energy patterns that are going on within it, but you're also actively doing things to cause changes within those energy patterns. That's kind of stage three. And I think, as I've said a lot of times, the thing you're trying to do at stage three is get a variety of activity going on that is um that is uh, adding to the richness of the energy patterns that are involved in your let's let's talk about spirit dance you know yeah because i was going to ask you about that because we talk about spirit dance and we also talk about animal spirit dance don't we Oh, let's stay off animal spirit dance for this episode, yeah, mate. Yeah. We're, we're gonna we'll come back to that at a later date. So we'll just talk about regular old spirit dance here. Uh, animal animal spirit dance is very complex, but it is, uh, I guess you could say, it is something that you can do to add richness into your spirit dance. Is to add uh, animal spirits into that dance that adds more richness but there's more to it than that i mean the the, the the major 
issue with animal spirit dance is it's very much more environment. It's very much more context. It's very much more of that extending out well past your yourself in a shamanic sense. The the animals what I are thought, real, just real animals. What I thought was fascinating is you, you mentioned in a previous episode that with the animal spirit dance, it's 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 about trying well trying maybe that's the wrong word but experiencing the world through the lens of an animal and it's different to yourself i may have got that slightly exactly. no, that's mixed up but right. i think yeah okay that's right um and it gives you new experiences and new ways of of, of experiencing the, the the world outside of yourself doesn't it yeah so that's bobuk in in mongol um so you are <sighs> You know, when people talk about animal spirits, very often people imagine that it's some spirit animal that comes and talks to you. And in a way, it kind of can be seen in that way. But it's much more the essence of the animal itself, mochoi, the snake, or bach, the tiger, chono, the wolf. Um, the animals themselves are the essence of real animals that a shaman takes on in order to gain a broader understanding of life because you're taking on a context outside of even human beings. The further you go away from human beings with the animals is um, the world becomes stranger. So, which is why a lot of the spirit animals that are used in shamanic technique by shamans are not massively distantly related to us. I guess you would say the birds, uh, like Burhant, uh, or the snakes, uh, they are as far as we get away from human beings, you know. But in, in, for instance, in the martial arts, we have. Some people taking on the spirit of a mantis, for instance, which is an insect, right? You know, that's that's getting pretty far away from human beings. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just becomes an alien, a bit more of an alien world. Whereas would it be without- more beneficial? <laughs> this might be a silly question, but would it be more difficult and more interesting to exp- <laughs> to, to try and experience the animals that are more further distant yeah, from us? Because obviously it's you've definitely got- interesting. You've got chimpanzees and monkeys and stuff, which are very similar, and then you've got snakes yes. and antelopes and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. It gets thing. more difficult. It gets more difficult, though, because, you know, we know what the major trap, the, the imagination trap, is the major yeah. pitfall or, or barrier to shamanism. And the temptation for human beings towards the imagination trap as you get into those why we call exotically distant animals. A mantis would be a great example of that. It's it's all too easy to start imagining a mantis's world rather than experiencing a real mantis's world, if you like. Whereas we have so much in common with tigers and mucht horses and bachgai bears. Uh, we have so much in common with those animals that that we stand a chance of trying to experience their world. In general, you do see this. You know, you see people who've brought bears up in captivity or, you know, even those guys, those cool guys in the far west of Mongolia who hunt with golden eagles on their arms, you know. Yeah. you With the golden eagle, you don't... The, the proposition is very different from, for instance, what we would call falconry in the west. The falconry is... The proposition to the falcon is... You know, here's some food that I'm going to give you if you do these tricks or these cool things that I want you to do. It's hunting for me. That That's a simple proposition with, say, a peregrine falcon or something of that nature. Not to say there isn't some shamanism involved in, in becoming close to one of those birds as well. But you have a choice there. I mean, some of, so you can just say that some of that training is pure bribery, you know. Yeah. Um, with a golden eagle being used for quote-unquote falconry. (laughs) Falconry is a bit of a tame term, isn't it, when you're talking about a golden eagle on your arm. The the proposition is very different. You do these tricks for me and I'll take this, I'll give you some of this little bit of food that doesn't work with those birds. Because it's like, the bird can just think, well, why don't I just take it from you? (laughs) 
you. <laughs> you, know, you, you have to have a close relationship with them and you have to, to a certain extent, you have to understand the world in their terms. And eagles are bred in Mongol. They are highly, highly intelligent creatures. Mm. Um, but what we've learned from them as shamans is massively important in our shamanism. That, that kind of expansive focus that eagles have when they're hunting is a, is, is a real insight into bat, one of the three major components that we've described for Bhaktamtis and for Chalisti. The way that the Bored see the world is similar to us, but other than us, we can look at things, you know. Mm. But a difference between human intelligence and Bored intelligence would be if you're sat up on a mountain somewhere looking out over a valley in a state of chelusty and thinking of absolutely nothing and you're a very miasmatic civilized human being, you're going to find that difficult on a long-term basis. You're going to find it difficult to sit up there and not think about your life, not think about your work, not think about your family, your loved ones, um, the things that are going on in your life, the things that are important to you, what your ambitions are for the future, what impact the past has had on you. You're going to have a real hard job to sit up there for 24 hours looking out over that valley, unmoving, and thinking of absolutely nothing, switch your brain off. A golden it's eagle one of the, the toughest things to do, man. Yeah, it's, a uh, golden yeah. eagle, on the other hand, will have no problem at all doing that, despite its huge intelligence. It will have no problem at all doing that. Um, mm. And so one of the... Um, one of the things with animal spirit dance is that that is what you're trying to do as a shaman, incorporating animals into your spirit dance. You're trying to see the world through the eyes of our cousins, through their lives, through their context, through what's important to them. And the great thing with all these different animals is that, that, that we have to draw upon is that they are different from each other as well. And yet there's a sameness there. There's a commonality there. And the commonality is ultimately the energy of the universe. What's common is what's common to all. Mm. And so that's that's a, a, an idea behind the animal spirits. But the point with... The oh, it's, it's taking us down a rabbit hole, hasn't it? I, I, I just wanted to... Um... It's not, but the, the key point with the animals is that it, I don't want to give the impression that you have to start incorporating animal spirit dance into your spirit dance in order to move on to level four. You do yeah, not. Yeah, because I was going. I was going to ask. It's all great with you know experiencing the animals and everything, but what about us as human beings? Because we are also animals. So, so I was going to just link that back and just ask you: um, Is that the whole point of spirit dance rather than animal spirit dance? It's not about animals. It's about us as human beings as animals. Um, that's not the point oh. of spirit dance. Um, but that is that is what animism is all about. That is yeah. the, the essence. We are, as a matter of fact, animals. I think we talked about this a little bit on the last one. So it's we can fact. choose humans to be our animal uh, spirit. Indeed, dance. and in the, the wonderful martial art of Xing Yi, that is the dragon, isn't it? That's the, the symbol of the uh, purported founder, or the, at least the person from whom uh, the Xing Yi gets its, its sort of stalwart tradition, Yu Fei. That that's the dragon. Um, yeah. the, the the thing with the, the Xing Yi animals, there are 12 animals in Xing Yi, only one of which is quote-unquote mythological. But the dragon doesn't represent everything about human beings. It represents what's best in it, what's good in us, what's non-miasmatic in us. It represents us as, as wild animals, if you like, not as as, as primeval animals, not as, as we are, as we've made ourselves. But of course, also it represents the fact that we are able to make ourselves in lots of different images. It would never occur to an eagle to go out there and start practicing tiger spirit dance. It would be meaningless <laughs> to it, you know. Um, but to a human, shaman, that is something that we do. But that is part of us. That's part of our nature. 
that's part of our Xing is a Chinese word that, that, that refers to this kind of flavor or shape that we, we make in our environmental niches. The, the thing with human beings is that is part of our nature. But in many ways, to understand our nature, it's often helpful to move away and see ourselves from the outside, from a different perspective. And that's what the animals are useful for in shamanism, is to see us from the outside, outside looking inwards rather than from the inside looking out as we normally see ourselves. Yeah. So, so, but the, the point I wanted to make here is that if, if you are getting on well with your, if, if say you're taking spirit dances, your route towards shamanism or one of part of your route towards shamanism, then you do not need to incorporate animal spirits into your spirit dance in order to start working on level four. You just need to be very, very good at your butchik, very, very good at what spirit dance you do do. Um, and what I mean by good it is you need to be able to do whatever it is you can do without thinking about it. You can be, in a, in a state of chillicity. That's yes. his test, isn't it? Maintain and that's, it in chillicity. Yeah. And as we said in the level three stuff, it's easy to do that with a small range of movement. It's quite relatively straightforward, you know, to do that side, 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 side kind of step and go into a kind of uh, shamanic state of um, consciousness. Well, the repetitive but, movement helps you do that. It's like the yeah the drum yes, that just but, keeps banging, 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 going. It's but like a a trans-inducing. But there's a big but. You're not going to make a very interesting weave doing that. Yeah. You're good yeah. at it. It's going to be boring and dull. Um, and you're not going to learn very much, frankly. If you just have one movement that you can do without thinking about it, I would I would you, say it'll be absolutely fascinating if it's your first time doing it. You'll be like, oh, I've done something. Yay. Um, and then you can build on it. But if, if I, I know if I did that, that for the first time, I'd be like, that's not boring. That's not dull. If you that really want good. to get something out of your guru, I would practice. I would say you need... Uh, it's not individual movements. Um, it's not individual movements. It's individual categories of patterns of movement or momentum or energy change you you probably need you know a, a minimum of eight minimum you know going going across you know if you were to take their trigrams and and pick something that's characteristic of each one of them to incorporate each one of those eight patterns into your spirit dance uh, to the point where you can do all eight and you can free flow them freely Without any tie rack, obviously, when you're doing the tie rack, <laughs> you've got to do the tie rack. But okay. tie rack any being unintentional cutting. tie rack or any any uh... that's cutting the flow of the movement, isn't it? I mean, yes. this, oh. this this brings us into a whole other topic. We have talked about yeah. this, the 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 eight energies, haven't we? In terms of stage three, um, yes. But there's definitely more to more to mine from that, and and, and more um, well, each deep one dive them, series to go into. So yeah, well, also, and they they work in pairs. Uh, that's what the whole uh, Japanese concept of tatsu tatsu or her yi in Chinese. That's what that's all about. Um, so there's also a ton more on level three stuff that we could talk about in terms of that. But my, yeah, my maybe we should go simply, back to that after after we um, will do it some point after this one. We will do it some point in time. But the point here is that it's a minimum mm. of a coverage of those eight. You know that would be a good. I'm not saying that it's definitely eight and not ten or twenty or fifteen or whatever. I'm saying that it's an absolute minimum before you start trying to move from level three to level four. I would say you need a minimum of eight energy change patterns going on in your spirit dance, flowing from one end to the other or mutually supporting each other before you attempt or start working properly on Guruk. So it, and that, that all has to be done without thought. It all has to be done in a state of chillicity. Obviously, also in the state of Amsterdam. So you could yeah. you could create your own sequence of movements, and just bear with me um, because I know a sequence of movements is perhaps the wrong yeah, terms. It's definitely not. You a could sequence. create you could create your own repetitive sequence of movements that incorporate those energies to start with, and then work towards being able to do that in chillicity. That's um, not or, how or, I would do it. No. Or, or is it a continuous flow of randomized so movements is, that use those? This is those? one of the things with with martial arts forms, for instance. Um, it forms I'm in totally in two minds about. Uh, some of the martial arts that I do are uh, poor scorn on forms. 
and some of the martial arts that I do incorporate forms. Um, and that kind of gives me uh, a kind of interesting perspective, I guess, that I do both sides of the equation, martial arts that think forms are valuable, martial arts that think forms are a waste of time. I do both. The issue here is that the, the downside of forms is the sequence. That's the downside of them. They teach people to do movements in a set sequence. And sure enough, if you learn martial arts forms in a set sequence, you can learn something from that. But in my opinion, you need as quickly as possible in the training process to be able to vary that sequence and to start, I mean, spontaneously vary it and to start mixing it all up. So the way I look at forms is the way the forms often looked at in Kempo, which is variably down and up on them is that they are catalogues of movement, but they are not sequences. Sure, it's a sequence so that it's easy to remember, so you just remember your coverage. The, the sequence has all of the things in it, all the patterns of movement that you're supposed to cover in it. But actually, for it to be any value, you have to be able to do any one of those things in any order and continuously flow from one into the other. Then you can stand a chance of using some of that stuff in in a fight or in a in a martial situation. Another thing is, that another downside of forms is forms often seem to be the be-all and end-all of some martial arts practice. You know, a lot of martial arts have, you need to have a form to get a particular belt. I remember doing this, for instance, when karate when I was a kid. But I don't think you know a form. You know, I would never be handing a belt out to somebody who knew a form um, for, say there was a form for that particular belt, whatever the martial art is that has belts, I'm not handing that belt out unless that person, A, can do the form, B, can free link it, and that means any movement in any order without stopping. Uh, C, they can demonstrate a practical application of every single movement in that form without exception, and D, they can incorporate every single movement from that form without inspection, without exception into free sparring or free fighting against a resisting opponent. If they can do all of those things, then I might give them the belt with what's in that form. But if they just know the sequence, that to me, that's meaningless. That's the least important of all of those things. Do you follow what I mean? And this is true of spirit dance as well. The least important thing in spirit dance or the worst way, you know, one of the worst things you could possibly do with your spirit dance is to pick a portfolio of things and do them in the same order yep. every time you do it. You, so you so shouldn't be deciding. You should not be deciding what movements or energy patterns you are using in your spirit dance. They should spontaneously arise. Mm. There should be no decision process involved. So so th picture this scenario then. We've got our... We've, we've got our... Um, eight movements and eight energy changes that we are utilizing within our dance. We are moving freely between any one of them at any given time in a state of chelicity. Um, so it's like a controlled, uh, it's like a controlled flow. It's not like you're doing anything, but you've got, you've got your eight kind of, I'm hesitant to use the word, but eight movements, eight energy changes, and you are, and like I said, you're in a stertulist and you're just moving between them without thinking, but you are limited to those. Is, would that be... No, no, there's no limitation. There's no, don't, for God's sake, don't start limiting yourself. What, that's, that's not what I mean by eight. I said a minimum of eight. The, there's no limitation. If something else comes out, then something else comes out. What, what I mean is you need, eight, you need a number of energy changes that you can embody in your dance. Now, these are not like just set movements. These are like different movements. You know, for instance, cyclical energy, uh, compressive and expansive energy, or um, overturning energy, or flow underneath energy, or, you know, the, the, a bunch of different things, even cutting energy, Tyrac. The, the, the point is that you need to be able to exhibit all those things in your spirit dance without thought, but you're definitely not limiting them ourselves to it's the exact opposite. You incorporate as much stuff as you possibly can without thought. So every constantly you're adding more and more patterns of movement or more and more energy patterns into your spirit dance constantly throughout your life. And as time goes by, you can do more and more and more. And there is no disadvantage to having more over having less. 
But even being able to do one or two is difficult for a lot of people. So that's what I meant by yeah, it was like an absolute bare minimum of that's that's where I was trying to come up with a number eight or ten or whatever. Absolute bare minimum of that you can do in a set of just if you can do twenty, for God's sake, don't limit yourself to eight. Do, do you follow what I mean? Well, the reason the reason why I latched on to eight is because that just makes complete sense to me because we've done lots of this in person uh, and and when we did it, it was yeah. very much the eight trigrams and we went through each trigram. And it's like this is a this is a f- flavor. Of this is this is kind of like how that movement would be in terms of that particular trigram. And we kind yeah. of, it's so hard thinking of the right words to say. Um, As we go up the it's going to get hard. Wait, wait, wait uh, till we go on to level five. <laughs> yeah, but it makes sense. All I'm trying to say is we've done it before. I get those eight trigrams. I get what those energy changes are. Uh, yeah, and so yeah. the eight makes sense to me. Um, the, yeah. the, when you go beyond that, you're talking about, because I thought those eight trigrams are like the fundamental energy changes now when you say more than that well let's no, say that's not what use... i mean a, a trigram the eight fundamental energy changes each one of which can be expressed in a bunch of different ways but it's still uh, got that particular dance. trigram at its core yes, even yes, though it's but expressed that's not what differently I mean. yeah but okay. the point is say tolko yeah which is jag in armor bell technology tick tolko that's a, all the yangs in in chinese thought yeah yeah there are a million different ways to express yang, a jag, in terms of spirit dance. And it's possible for a person to be able to express some of those ways without thought and still not to be able to do other ones of those ways without thought. Do you follow what I mean? This is what I'm talking yeah. about in terms of the thing. So uh, Tothko and Negdech, those two work in pairs often, so you could do um, uh, the change of Tothko which is kind of a, a popping or spot of kind of change with the energy. Uh, you could do that in a ton of different ways. And you can do negdech, which is kind of a joining, you know, taking energy streams and joining them together. You can do that in a ton of different ways. But also, you can do the two together. They work really nicely together in an almost infinite different ways. But those different ways, it's not true that just because you can do some of them doesn't mean you can do all of them in a state of spirit dance. Do you follow me? And so, yeah. so so, what I meant when I said a minimum of eight is what I meant was if you can do energy patterns in your spirit dance that get some minimal coverage of the energy changes, the changes, then that would be adequate to go on to level four. Um, but think of all the combinations. What about uh, Tothka and Asach? Uh, that would be, you know, in Chinese terms, that would be all the Yangs and then a Yang baseline, but Yin midline, Yang top line. Put those two together. Or oh, Shurug and Egeldech. Um, in Chinese terms, uh, that would be uh, Yin baseline, Yang midline, Yang top line. And Yang baseline, Yin midline, Yin top line, they're, they're, they're a kind of um, Ahai Yi, though, in, in Chinese understanding, they're like a two and one pair. There was literally just off the top of my head, you know, I hate to think how many ways that I could personally express that in spirit dance and I'm not the you know I, I'm far from the end of that road if there is an end to that road uh, I've been working on this a lot of years but but I, I could think I could just work on incorporating new expressions of those two by themselves into my spirit dance every day for the rest of my life and never get to the end of that that's that's what I mean um, by the directors because ultimately what are those things they are echoes of the creation they are echoes of the creation of the universe coming down through the generations down to us as human beings and in a way they're not what we experience today as them is not the things themselves it's the things as they were at the beginning that give rise to everything that is and we see these recurring patterns within them uh, as a, on a kind of post-analysis basis um, and we um we uh, can use that just to check our coverage. You know, that's that's. I, I, I don't want to push the eight trigrams as a model for spread dance or anything. I'd I'd push it as a sort of post analysis, sort of litmus test of your coverage on your own personal spread dance. That's all. Have you got those things covered? If the answer to that is yes, then that's probably a decent sort of beginner's starting point for guruch. Um, but what I mean by covered is you can express those eight things. Uh, with some kind of movement that you don't have to think about that will f- and flow freely from between all eight um, 
without cutting, except when you are doing time, like <laughs> when you're supposed to yeah, cut. Yeah. Um, then, <laughs> then, then your your butchig is adequate enough to start working on some gura. That's probably the best way to put it. You know what? Yeah. It's like um, perhaps what was inevitable. We've uh, we've gone down another another rabbit hole here with. I don't think it's a rabbit hole, mate. It's a foundation. Uh, I mean, we're not talking about level four, though. We're talking about level three. Um, but it yeah. is important to to know you know whether you're going to get out anything out of doing level four of practice on level four that there's your litmus test i think my my personal this is just my personal opinion this is not written in stone in the holy tablets of shamanism <laughs> uh, my personal opinion is if you got those eight covered off uh in your butchik in your spirit dance and spirit dance is the technique or the portfolio of technique that you're using to uh kick mm-hmm. off with level four then you're we'll ready have to go. Have a chat. Then you're ready we'll to have go. to have a chat, yeah. Damon, about how we can try and teach that or get that across um, and yeah. revisit yeah. stage three. I, I think. Yeah. I think that would be. But quite we should interesting probably. People. We should probably talk about stage four since we've. Yes. So since we've got here. Let's say we've got so, that. We've. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're all. We're, we're all. We know we're all we're good. We've got, we've got our eight trigrams. Our says. bare minimum foundation. <laughs> yeah. So, um, just another quick review as well. The without thought thing, you know, there are also other ways to look at it, not just like using the air trigrams or, you know, they're, they're not trigrams. Are you? Not, it, to a Mongolian shaman, they've probably never heard of the air trigrams. But they're energy changes, they're common energy changes. And they're the same ones because they're the same ones in Bolivia, right? And they're the same ones in, um, you know, every, wherever you are in the world, Antarctica or wherever you are, it's the same, it's the same energy changes, right? So, and, and you don't need human beings for them. Animals, wild animals use these energy changes as well, as do inanimate objects like planets and stuff, you know. So, <laughs> although I haven't said that, thinking about that, not all planets are inanimate, are they? So, uh, in fact, as I recall, even Pluto is not inanimate. They've got plenty of active stuff going on there. So, despite the temperatures... The another thing just to say is another way to which we've talked about before, another way to assess where you're at with your spirit dancing, not in terms of coverage, but in terms of again post analysis of where you're at is that sort of physical chalisti aspect, the ayog, the, the sort of vessel form between Tirot and Havtas that goes, you know, between those two uh, containments of energy. And, and all those kind of characteristics we talked about, Asqui, the idea of heaviness and lightness simultaneously, the energy stored in the body, and this kind of springiness like a bow and umluch, the uh, idea that you're running under a, a cover of some kind, a cover of the environment that you're in, Bantaglach, the the covering for the shoulders, hanging over the shoulders, the baldric, the, the murch. Uh, Murch, sorry, not Murch, Murch. Um, and then, you know, the idea of the, the bangles and, and containing the, 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 the bangle, the borki, those aspects of physical chalisti are also really important. Um, together with Tengis, which is kind of drawing energy in from the environment in your spirit dance, you start to get a sense of that, almost like a, especially if you pick a really good grove, you know, to practice in. You, you get start to get a real sense of that. And all of these things, these come through practice. They come through long, long practice of your spirit dance. Uh, practice, practice, practice is really important. Obviously, it's really important to not thinking while you're doing it because you need to be able to do this stuff without thinking. But it's also really important to get a handle on these things and these characteristics that you need in your physical chalisti, which promotes uh, promotes spiritual chalisti, which is what you need for your shamanic technique. So, so just to say that those things are also important in this, and, and through those things, you start to get a sense of the energy patterns in the movement that you're using, and through those things, you start to get a sense that those energy patterns flow or continue f- throughout. Now, this is a difference between spirit dance and guruk, between butchik and guruk. In butchik, we are spontaneously generating movement after movement continuously. And we, we, in a physical sense, we're getting a kind of continuity of the momentum 
and energy that's going on in the body uh, that's been transmitted through the body within the environment, moving around the grove, moving around the things that are in the environment. The That energy continuity, once you start to get into Guruk, becomes the main focus. So it's no longer the dance movements. It's no longer the... Um, it's no longer the aspect of physical chalisti. It's no longer the changes themselves that are the focus of the shamanic technique at the guruk level. It's a step beyond that. It's the energy patterns themselves that you are creating this kind of weave of movement. And this is why richness in your spirit dance is really important or richness in your drum technique is really important because it ain't going to be much of a weave that's what guruk literally means, a weave as in woven energy. It ain't going to be much of a weave if you're doing really boring, simplistic, repetitive yeah. movement. Yeah, And the weave is important when we come onto the next level, the modok. We'll see why when we get onto level five, but just take it from me that it's important. It's kind of a radar for nature that you're making. And what you find as you do this with the guruk is that you're no longer participating in movement. You're no longer participating in dance steps. You're no longer participating in breathing. You're no longer participating in momentum. You're participating instead in energy flow and energy pattern and energy constant weave and flow of energy. And this comes through your practice. So try to, you know, if you practice butchig every day, spirit dance every day for five years. Um, and you do it hours every day. You try and stop yourself moving into Guru. Uh, it, it, it will happen as long as you maintain the chalisti. As soon as the chalisti goes out the move out the window, it becomes ordinary dance. Yeah, that's we've talked about this a lot before. The chalisti has to be maintained throughout. And if the chalisti dies while you start, which it probably will, when you start practicing Guru, don't try and fix your Guru. Go back down the stack, fix your butchig. Fit your Amska, fit your Bakhtamtis up. Don't try to fix the problem at Guruk because Guruk is not the problem. Chalisti, or that lack thereof, is the problem. And so, so the, you, you start to find that it's the energy itself, the patterns of energy that flow throughout the movement that you're making and throughout the environment that you're in. It's that the threads of that energy that become the main focus and the way in which they weave around each other and interact with each other, that becomes the main focus. And it's there are no longer any dance steps and there are no longer any, um, you know, kind of physical things going on. It's much more a pure energy flow. This is the first time I get the feeling that um, st stage stages three into four is just such a, natural progression because if you've really got that move that 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 chalicity exactly. and the flow and in the spirit dance then like you say it's like well it's going to be inevitable that that it's going to be you'll start to experience yeah. those changes and those energy changes and they will become the the yeah um that exactly. makes sense to me it, it yeah and, it, and it's about the each movement flowing into the next yeah so, that so just to just to give an example say you have five dance steps that happen, yeah, mm. um, you know, within your dance. Uh, pick the number five just off the, completely off the top of my head. There may be five separate dance steps, but it's one energy, yeah? That's one pattern of energy that has mm. come out of your dance, or one energy weave, because probably there's more than one energy thread going on in that movement, especially if your dance is nice and rich. Hopefully there's loads of energy threads. The more threads, the better, yeah? As far as a shaman's concerned, not necessarily as far as martial arts are concerned, but as far as a shaman's concerned, the more threads, the better. And the more interesting the ways in which they interact with each other, the better. But here's the key to Guruk, and this is, we're going to go over this in more detail in, in, detail in, in, in future episodes, but here's the key to Guruk. In some senses, the entire dance, this is where you want to get to with Guruk, your entire dance, so say you're dancing for half an hour, the entire dance creates one energy weave and it stands. Yeah. 
It stands. It's there at the start, it's there at the end, and it's there everywhere in between. And this is the hard thing to put into words, is you know you're getting somewhere with the guruk when those energy threads stand. They are there. In a sense, they're there ahead of your movement, they're there in your movement, and they're there behind your movement. And and there's this is the whole thing with a shamanic state, not seeing a massive difference between the future and the past and the present. All things are there at once. And the purpose of Guruk, the ultimate purpose that you're trying to get to, is to create a stand, what I would call a standing weave, a standing Guruk. Uh, one that is at there at, at all times, in the same way that there are standing weaves within nature. Barth uh, Ech in Mongol, there are standing weaves within nature that are uh, like source. Source is a, um, a Mongolian term that sort of means shadows or uh, spirits. Oh gosh, there's that word spirit again. Um, I'll, I'll actually just, is, just hold yeah. up my hand and I'll say to everybody, a fascinating episode we did a long time ago is actually on that word spirit. I think it was episode five. Yeah, that was uh, a good one, wasn't a, it? That's a really good, it's one of, I think that's probably my favourite episode. Yeah, yeah, me too. Made a lot me of things too. click for me, did that. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. It'd yeah, be good to indeed. go back to that one. So definitely at level four, you know, we say shamanism is a portfolio of techniques. Well, it is mm. at face value. But here we are going beyond technique. This is the point, the guruk level. And it doesn't matter whether it's drum or whether it's shamanic piano or whether it's, you know, a spirit dance or what it is. This is definitely a trans, what you say, a transcendence of technique. There are definitely techniques, if you like, at Buchik. But a guruk, the only technique is really what that standing weave, the nature of that standing weave that you create, which is different every time. And as we go on, we'll see that, you know, that, that you start to, one of the great advantages of Guru, and I do, do, definitely don't want to analyze this stuff on the baseline. I'm just trying to explain it on the baseline to give a flavor of what it is we're talking about. What well, Certainly what I found in my life when I started getting a handle on Guru was that I started seeing or perceiving these standing weaves. That, well, when I say they're standing, they're not static. They're constantly morphing and changing, but yet they stand in a sense that they're not coming and going, yeah, or they're mm. not disappearing. They're not created and then destroyed. They change from one form into another, but they stand. Um, I started seeing these weaves and things beyond my spirit dance. Um, I started seeing them in nature, effectively, and. Then, you know, the, the point with Guruk, where we're trying to get to, we're just talking about the start of Guruk here today, but at the end of Guruk, where we're trying to get to the where the weave that you are generating through your spirit dance or whatever other techniques you're applying is no different from the weave that is within the environment that you're in, say the grove, the natural environment that you're practicing in, that it's... It's not that you create a weave there within that environment. It's that that environment has a weave in which your weave is a fully, uh, fully integrated, incorporated part yeah. in participant uh, as supporting the weave of the environment. Um, I'm afraid as we go up the levels on this podcast, these things are going to get harder and harder to talk about in words. And I come, it's just. All I can do is just keep mentioning the imagination trap, the imagination trap, the imagination trap over and over again. And as we talk about Guruk and Modok, the next level, um, I, I suggest we set an egg timer or something and med mention the imagination trap like every 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The alarm's gone off. Hey, guys, don't forget. <laughs> Did we mention the imagination trap? Well, but speaking so, of the imagination, because so you, you just mentioned yeah. that you 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 saw the the weave, so uh, I imagine you don't mean that in a literal sense, or you may do. I don't know, I, but um, I don't know how you would mention because you know shamanic learning, shamanic understanding is experiential, mm. and it's a different way to learn. It's a completely different way to learn that I, I learned a different way to learn through shamanism. 
It's not how we learn in school and it's not how we learn at university. It's not how we learn sports. It's not even how we learn martial arts, though some martial arts have some aspects of shamanism. I think in everyday life, the martial arts is one of the most shamanistic things that a significant number of people participate in. Um, but it's not even that way of learning. It's a whole other way of learning. It's a way that you learn fully experientially. 100% of the learning is, is experiential. As soon as you try and interpret that to others, you're not really in the realm of shamanism anymore. You're in the realm of esotericism. So I guess this is an esoteric podcast. It's not a shamanic podcast because that's what we've been trying to do from the beginning. Here we are at episode 50, uh, which is wonderful, has to be said, to get to episode 50. Um, we have uh, We have tried to encourage people to take on a more shamanic lifestyle and it, it, you know you guys who listen to us thanks ever so much for a start um it's fantastic the support we've had has been unbelievable since we started this podcast i mean from our patrons but from everybody has been absolutely unbelievable and i think we've we've i think that people who've listened to our podcast for a long time Hopefully you know what we're talking about when we talk about the imagination trap. That we're talking about something real here. We're not talking about something that's, you know, you just imagine it in your head and that's it. And and I think one of the reasons why the imagination trap is so prevalent within shamanism is that people are used to that way of learning. We're encouraged to be creative and to be imaginative as kids in school, for instance. Um, and I remember art classes in school where I was encouraged to be imaginative by my teachers and there's nothing wrong with that but my teachers never frowned on imagination they never told me there were downsides to imagination um, and imagination can be vastly useful in many different areas of life it can even be useful in some small aspects of shamanism but it's a much bigger barrier than it is a mm. useful tool within this particular subject area well you just conflated imagination and creativity there so what's uh, yeah. what might be interesting is like um because one could say well in the spirit dance um you are in the process of creation in the moment yeah you're um, participating in the creation so here's the difference but it's not me i am not the creator the, the you're participating in the creation but you are not the creator of it. That's where you want to go with your guru. I guess you start off as the creator in Butchig, uh, in your tam, in your in your spirit dance. You start off as the creator, mm. uh, but you're trying. You know, between level three and the end of level four, you're trying to get away from that, um, drop that bit of the miasma off behind you. We said as we went through the levels, we talked about what we have to shed, and that idea of you as the creator of this stuff also has to be shed and i guess this is where you would do it guru level four so would one way to think about it then maybe just like you said you 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 are the creator throughout the spirit dance and we'll use the creator term loosely because yes we're, we're mm. in chillicity we're in that present moment and then um as you progress from stage three the spirit dance into stage four the weave yeah um the the creation aspect you being the creator disappears and it's more about the natural flow of the movements that naturally flow into each other irrespective of you and, and your uh, partly the movement, movement between them but it, it's partly what you are who you are where you are um but the it, it's not just the flow of the your movement it's the flow of the movement the movement the shape of all shapes as it's been described the um the shape of all ships as they move together as one thing. It's the movement of all, the movement of everything, not your movement. That's where you want to go with Guru. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So um, you've got, we've obviously got a plan for the next few episodes to try and get a little bit deeper into this, but um, yeah, yeah. do you think that's a... Interesting yeah, I think place that's a pretty decent as an, as an introduction. A pretty decent intro, yeah. All right. 
Brilliant. So shall we leave it there then, Damon, and uh, pick this up in the next, uh, the next, I'm going to say the next lesson for this one. <laughs> I'm so used to saying a lesson, <laughs> but I guess the next lesson slash episode, we're in lesson yeah. territory now. Um, the, the, the next guidance session. <laughs> the next guidance lesson. session, yeah. The next, <laughs> the, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's probably a better term, isn't it? Well, there's another thing I need to tell you. This, this you have to do for yourself. Yeah, nobody's going to do this for you. Nobody's going to tell you how to do it. You have to figure out this for yourself. Yeah. But, you know, we can we can talk about where you might go with it, how you might approach it, but you're going to have to do it yourself. Yeah, well, it reminds me of that time when we went to uh, Beaumont Park. Um, not Beaumont Park, yeah, the reservoir near where we used to train. And yeah. you just t- said to me, you just said to, uh, to a few of us, just go over there, stand over there, and uh, stare out over the lake and do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, David, I will... Yeah. Uh, I'll give obey. you an interesting anecdote. <laughs> Many years ago, uh, I had a really bad martial arts teacher. This is back in the 1970s. Uh, I think everybody had really bad, bad martial arts teachers in those days. Well, not everybody, but, you know. Um, mm. the, the, should we say the standards left much of, of, of instruction left much to be desired? Um, and one of the things my teacher said to me is, is, is my way or the highway? Uh, that means you do it my way or you, you might as well go away. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, in shamanism, it's the exact opposite of that. It's your way or the highway. Yeah. It's your way or the highway. Yeah. You have to yeah, find the way yourself. Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay, well, I hope you've all enjoyed this episode. And uh, this is one of, um, I presume, quite a few to come in stage four. So we can all look forward to that. Like I said at the beginning, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please uh, give us a, a review, an honest review. Um, wherever you get your podcast from and um, maybe pass this podcast on to a friend that would be super helpful but uh, as always thanks for listening and uh, we'll see you in the next one all the best guys thanks